It is my pleasure to welcome you this evening um, to this evening with COA Trustee Emeritus John Wilmerding. I want to especially thank the members of the Champlain Society for making evenings like this possible, as well as supporting year-round academic excellence at the college. It would be foolish of me to waste this opportunity to tell you a little bit about the role of the arts at the college. As you might imagine, it's a little bit different from other institutions of higher ed. First of all, the arts at every level, advanced classes and courses, are avail available to every student, not just the art majors. In fact, the arts are not isolated in studios or theaters, but make up the fabric of the college as a whole. We believe that the work of drawing, filmmaking, photography, performing arts and painting enrich the connections between disciplines as diverse as international business, sustainable food systems, environmental sciences, and natural history. For example, um, graduating senior Jane Pacelli designed and built, painted and wrote an interpretive display about the importance of bioluminescence in animals. That display is now at Acadia National Park. Alice Anderson shot a series of short documentary films about Maine's fishing industry. Juan Olmeda designed and drew a figurative model of crops and livestock production for arid Central America after researching similar methodology, methodologies in the Mediterranean. We believe that interdisciplinary education helps students learn about and understand issues from multiple perspectives. The arts accelerate connection making. In its February 2004 issue of the Harvard Business Review, they said that one of the breakthrough ideas of the year was the MFA is better than the MBA. <coughs> Daniel Pink, the author of that idea, meant that the must-have degree for survival in today's business climate is no longer the master of business administration. It is rather the master of fine arts. His argument ran, in our competitive and evolving economy, being logical and analytical is no longer enough. It is right brain thinking, the kind of processing that is intuitive and creative that helps stir innovation. Of course, some of us just love the arts and don't need it to do anything other than delight, inspire, intrigue, perplex, and engage. And I, am not, and I am certainly not slighting the MBA degree. After all, our newly appointed chair of the board, Will Thorndike, has a very nice one from Stanford, as well as a lovely undergraduate degree from Harvard. He will be introducing our speaker tonight, John Wilmerding. But let me say a couple of words about him. He is a lifelong summer resident of the island. Um, his parents were, and family, were instrumental in creating the college even before it was just a bubbling idea. In fact, the Thorndike Library um, is named after Aunt Betty and Uncle Amory. Um, and professionally, Will founded Housatonic Partners in Boston in 1994 and has been the managing director since that time. We are very happy to have him as the new chairman of the board. Will, please come up now and introduce John Wilmerding. And could I ask you to silence your cell phones and um, I was going to say pagers, but who has that anymore? Um, thank you so much. Thank you, Lynn. And thanks to all of you for coming to uh, tonight's event. It is a great honor to introduce John Wilmerding, who has been a wonderful long-term friend to the college. John is one of the preeminent art historians in the country. He received AB, Masters, and PhD degrees in art history from Harvard, was the curator of American art at the National Gallery, then senior curator, and eventually the deputy director at the National Gallery where he is now the chairman of the Board of Trustees. He was a visiting curator at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, and he is currently the Christopher Seraphim Professor of American Art Emeritus at Princeton University, 
and a trustee of the Guggenheim Museum. John is a scholar of great range. He did early influential work on and almost single-handedly revived the reputation of the 19th century Hudson River School, many of whom were active on MDI in the Rusticator days. And he is also an expert on the pop art movement of the 1960s. In fact, when I ran into him earlier this summer, he was wearing an Andy Warhol soup can t-shirt. So he has great range. John has long, deep island ties, having spent summers in Northeast Harbor since he was a boy. And among his many publications is the classic, The Artist's Mount Desert, American Painters on the Main Coast, and the recent Maine Sublime, which focuses on the MDI sketches and sketchbooks of Frederick Church. Importantly, he has also been a great supporter of COA. He is currently a trustee emeritus and was a longtime loyal, active trustee of the college. Alice Walton, the daughter of Walmart founder Sam Walton, had a vision that involved creating, from scratch, a major American art museum near the family's homestead in northwestern Arkansas. She could have chosen any art historian in the world to help her in designing the museum and assembling the collection, and she chose John as a founding trustee and key, advisors, key advisor. Crystal Bridges opened in November to great acclaim, immediately securing a prominent spot on the American news museum scene, and, as reported by the New Yorker magazine, is debuting with an, an initial endowment four times the size of the Whitney Museums. John, who was intimately involved from the earliest days, has generously agreed to share with us this evening the story of the founding of this significant new American art museum, the first in this country since World War II. So with that, it is my great pleasure to turn things over to Professor and Trustee Emeritus, John Wilmerding. Thank you very much. Can you hear all right? Um, well, first, just to begin with a postscript, a uh, good many of you were here last year when I talked uh, about church. Uh, just to uh, bring that to full circle, that little exhibition is now open down at the Portland Museum, I'm happy to say. It's a small but sweet little show uh, of some of his best um, oil sketches and drawings. And Cornell University Press has published um, a, a very handsome little book uh, to go with it, of which I'm, I'm, I'm very, very pleased. So that's just a, uh, to wrap up um, last year's discussion. Uh, several of, of, of you have asked if I would talk about Crystal Bridges, and up until this point, I really didn't have any um, uh, imagery. And uh, uh, once it opened um, and uh, the museum got up to speed, I was able to get very good uh, <coughs> digital imagery. And so uh, I've been able to put this together. And I, I think, actually, before showing you some of the highlights, although I will begin with just two classic images that have come to be associated with the museum. Well, I'll give you a bit of backdrop. Uh, on the left, an aerial view, of, the, of course, of the museum itself, and perhaps the most famous, at least inaugurally famous, uh, painting in the collection, uh, formerly from the New York Historical, uh, New York um, Public Library, uh, the great Asher B. Durand, Kindred Spirits of 1849, uh, which has come to be, as I say, the kind of ki uh, kindred um, or a, a, a kind of um, a keynote picture uh, associated with the museum's collection. And as I realized in pairing these two images, uh, in a sense, bring together uh, the mutuality between architecture in its setting uh, and the spirit of the collection as represented by the Duran painting. But I think you might be amused, just I, I guess I really should start at the moment of creation, and that is how I came uh, to be associated with it at all. And I guess it goes back uh, eight years, 2004, in the summertime, about this time, I received a phone call out of the blue. Uh, and normally in the summers, I, as many of you know, I like to do my writing here, uh, and I like to um, sail in the afternoons, uh, and I don't particularly like doing business. And um, so I, I got a phone call, and the voice said, this is Ralph Lerner. 
Uh, now, I have to interrupt the sentence uh, to tell you about the Ralph Lerner that I knew at that moment, which is to say uh, a, an extremely disagreeable and uncooperative colleague of mine at Princeton, uh, <laughs> who was then the dean of the architecture school, and I was uh, chairman of the art department at that point. This is a good 15 years ago. And uh, this Ralph Lerner had made life unbearably miserable for our department. Uh, for me personally, as an administrator, did everything to undercut us. Um, when we were reviewed, for example, by outsiders, uh, he was there meddling. Just made life hell. And uh, uh, needless to say, I, I, uh, he was one of my least favorite colleagues. Uh, and so, the, and, uh, as you can imagine, the last name I wanted to hear on the telephone uh, when I picked it up that summer was Ra this is Ralph Lerner. Uh, and uh, so I, li I think literally uh, I said, um, uh, I, I really don't want to do business with you in the summer. Uh, write me a letter. And I hung up. Uh, and about um, little, little, little did I realize what would come of this. About two weeks later, uh, a very nice personal letter came from a, the Ralph Lerner, uh, from uh, is the law firm Sydney Biddle Austin Woods, I think, in New York. And it turns out Ralph Lerner uh, is probably the preeminent art lawyer in the country. Uh, and it was accompanied in the same mail with a handwritten personal letter from Alice Walton, both of whom were explaining that she had the intention of starting a new museum of American art, and they would like to hire me on stipend uh, to help uh, form, uh, help advise the, uh, the, uh, the collection. And so uh, that's, uh, that explained it, and uh, of course I profusely apologized. Uh, and w we then agreed to meet that September after I got back to, um, uh, to New York. And uh, some of you may have met Alice Walden, but I should say, uh, you know, almost instantly one likes her. Uh, we certainly hit it off right away. Uh, she's very, extremely down to earth, entirely in a sense, whatever preconception one might have uh, about being, the, if not the richest woman in the world, certainly one of, one of in this country and the world. Uh, I knew that name, uh, not much else. Um, but she's down to earth, dresses in grays and tans, very self-effacing, has a fantastic sense of humor, uh, needless to say, very smart in all kinds of ways, that is say well-read, needless to say, smart in, in the business sense as well. Uh, and so once this was described, and she was committed with energy to um, getting going on building the collection, the final decision at that point had not yet quite been decided about the architecture. Uh, I, uh, she was far enough along. Uh, she'd been uh, 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 flying around Europe looking at some of the great small museums, the Beiler and others uh, in Europe, uh, to familiarize herself with the museums of the size that she had in mind, but also uh, clearly had intended in her mind's eye, at least, that this would be set in the woods uh, the woods that have been chosen for the site of the museum, some 600 acres, was Walton family property on the north edge of Bentonville, Arkansas. And uh, she remembers vividly, even now, uh, riding and playing as a child in these woods. And over the years, uh, various family members uh, began to acquire pieces of these woodlands. They hadn't owned it all, but as the city developed, uh, uh, it was clear they wanted to save this. And so uh, the, the, this whole tract had been preserved right on the edge of town. So it is accessible in the museum itself. It's, uh, uh, it's, I can't remember which direction we're talking about, but its entrance up the river here actually has pedestrian access into this end of the museum. So one uh, can actually walk from the edge of town uh, through the parkland to get to the museum. Uh, it extends, I say, a good deal in this, this direction. She's created parking for bicyclists and so forth, uh, and has been encouraging uh, many of the commuters in the town, the city, uh, to park bicycles and bike, bike through the museum property uh, to work. Uh, before the museum opened last November, 
I think there was something like uh, 20 or 30 miles worth of not only pedestrian pathways created, uh, but bicycle paths and separate mountain bicycle paths. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, even now, uh, they figure it's receiving something like 4,000 people just passing through the, the, the parkland. So it's been a great vision in that sense. Um, so she considered several uh, uh, possible architects uh, for the project. Uh, I had mentioned, you know, commented on names. But really, uh, there, there was so much possibility in, uh, ahead of us for uh, acquisition that I really stayed out of the architectural choice. Uh, typically, Alice made that decision uh, quite decidedly herself. That is, say, Moishe Safdie, whose work she had admired. She'd been to the Skirball Center in, in Los Angeles, uh, had seen what the Peabody Museum in Essex had done, knew about his National Gallery in Canada. I think it might have uh, even visited uh, one of his uh, buildings in Europe. Uh, and very much liked his use of glass and his idea of, of seeing buildings in relationship to nature. Uh, it also happened, I think it was a kind of personal spark, again, a friendship between the two. Uh, they, they, again, readily got along. And like my first visit, got me in her truck or the Jeep at the time and said, let and just literally bushwhack, drove through the woods uh, down to the stream bed, Crystal Stream, on which this uh, museum is sited. Uh, and this uh, incident, uh, you know, this moment has been famously recounted. Um, as they were lurching over the mud and the uh, stones and so forth, Softy evidently fell out of the Jeep. Uh, it was covered with mud. Uh, and she said, oh, do you want to go back? Uh, and he said, no, no, this is such great fun. I love it. Got back in the Jeep. Well, that immediately endeared him to her. Uh, and at the end of, uh, of this little tour through the woods and the possibility of the site, he was so taken with it. Uh, that he said, well, now, what's, the, um, uh, what's the, the competition? What happens from here? Shall I submit drawings to, have you got a committee, and so forth? Uh, and she said, uh, no, you're hired. I am the committee. Uh, and that was that. It became an enormously successful partnership that began. And so that's another reason why I began with these two images, because that, that uh, um, I don't have the exact uh, detailed monthly chronology, but that was happening just about within the first year of my being brought on board as advisor. Uh, and within the year, the first year, I think it was now 2005, uh, the famous uh, Sotheby's auction was set up uh, by the New York Public Library. And as you may all remember, she, of course, was roundly criticized that this was a rape of New York treasures and she was removing things and so forth. And I guess I should say one simple sentence that virtually everything Alice has acquired, she has been offered. She has not gone around uh, like some vulture uh, saying, I will take this from that museum and so forth. Um, uh, the, the Sotheby's auction, I think, was a flawed setup in, in that it was a, a so-called closed auction by invitation. And as I recall, something like 30 individuals and museums were invited uh, to, uh, uh, to bid, uh, silent bidding. Uh, and uh, so she, needless to say, responded to that invitation. I remember earlier discussions with the library board, uh, and they were terrified that uh, this American classic uh, would, quote, go to Japan. Uh, it would, they were even terrified it would go to the Getty, the, the idea that something from New York could go to the West Coast. Uh, uh, and so that led to this very peculiar, as I say, uh, closed auction. In a way, it, you can't have it both ways, either from a fiduciary sense, you sell something and put it up to open bidding, uh, or you simply have a closed sale. Uh, so there was all of that uh, uh, very bad publicity. I think now that the museum clearly has opened, 10 years or near 10 years later, the whole tone of press coverage has changed when they've seen uh, what she accomplished. But that was a signature uh, acquisition in the sense that I think by anybody's standards, certainly of American art historians, this picture would be viewed as one of the sort of 10 greatest paintings by American artists, uh, uh, period. Uh, so indeed, it carried um, you know, a lot of baggage and a lot of uh, controversy. A very beautiful, important mid-19th century picture. 
Uh, timing is everything. Uh, it came up at that moment. But clearly, and I didn't, uh, because I was just going on the National Gallery board, I couldn't discuss it with her. As you know, the gallery and the Met uh, jointly made a bid uh, unsuccessfully. Uh, but it was clear, it's, or, there was nothing, no question about its art historical importance. I had nothing to do uh, with what she finally uh, paid for it. But I realized I two things. One, th this person was going for the highest quality and the most important works she could put her hands on. This was, in this signal gesture, was not going to be an ordinary kind of American art museum. Uh, and uh, over the last two or three generations, uh, most of us had thought that all the great collections of American art had been put together. The Gantz collection, the Horowitz collection, the Fraud collection, Rockefeller, and so forth. Uh, we thought there aren't American pictures out there that can be acquired. Well, this was the first one, so to speak, that could be acquired. And uh, I think we both realized, of course, uh, secondly, not only was the work of great quality, but it set the standard uh, for, uh, uh, in a sense, almost policy that she would go ever after the best that she could. Uh, it was a, uh, she's talked to herself about collecting her first acquisition she was very proud of, I think it was a 25 cent reproduction of a, a Picasso nude, uh, which she bought at some country fair and her father allowed her, allowed her to keep it. But um, uh, as she got interested in American art, first painting herself, then reading about it, then if, uh, she'd had a very modest but quite good personal collection, even before the decision to, to, to create a museum uh, was underway. Uh, and uh, uh, her own paintings are, are remarkably good. Um, but um, the idea of, of paintings of American nature struck a real chord with her. There's something, and I don't, I, I, and it's, it, 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 it's not a, a sort of a sentimental idea. There's a real sense of national patriotism uh, in, in her approach to creating this museum. Not just a gesture for Northwest Arkansas, in fact, for the state of Arkansas. Uh, she even had a map made uh, with little circles representing where museums, not just of America, art were placed all over the country. And there was just simply a yawning, uh, uh, you know, 300 mile circumference around Northwest Arkansas that had no museum. Uh, so, so this was, this has been a very dedicated, as I say, gesture for the state uh, and for her country, unabashedly, no question. But she made the link early on that nature was part of American identity, the defining aspect uh, really of the creating of the country and its settling through the, uh, the middle of the, uh, most of the 19th century. Uh, so this picture struck that chord. Um, as Asher Duran paints a memorial picture uh, to the founder of the Hudson River School, his friend, uh, slightly older artist, Thomas Cole, standing there on the ledge with William Cullen Bryant, the great nature poet whose family uh, gave the picture originally to the New York Public Library, standing there with every element of the Hudson River vocabulary contained in it, that is to say, the river uh, in the foreground, the opening vista to the sky, uh, an American eagle circling there in the background, the artist and the poet, sort of the, the marriage of the arts, as it were. Uh, this was, uh, was perceived at the time and ever since as a kind of summary picture, as I say, of American identity, particularly in 1849, this great midpoint in the years uh, b before the Civil War. And so that set up the, uh, the, the collection. Now, a great collector, and she has all these components, uh, obviously has to have resources, uh, only in this case, uh, almost indefinite, in, uh, you know, infinite resources. Uh, the endowment, uh, thanks to the uh, Walmart, to the Walton family, the Tysons, uh, is now close to, I think, 850 million. Uh, it's more than the National Gallery's endowment. Um, but that endowment is allocated for free admission in perpetuity, uh, free transport for all school groups coming uh, to the museum, uh, and obviously endowment for operations, maintenance, for some programs, uh, and for acquisitions. At the same time, uh, by not naming it a Walton Museum, uh, uh, she is obviously encouraging gifts uh, and, and further, su uh, further support. Um, the aerial view, before I move on, uh, shows you the complex as a whole. 
the, the, uh, the car access is uh, from a different side of town through the woods, brings you in uh, to a, a, a curving here where there's now a Roxy Payne tree uh, at the arrival. And all you see from the roadway or the parkway, uh, the driveway, is this very modest uh, covered portico. The museum proper is unseen. So this is clearly not a Getty. This is not a temple on the hillside. Uh, this is something you discover only as you come in, take a, a big elevator down into a circulation area where there's a wonderful George Rickey sculpture, and then you enter the museum, museum shop here, uh, and so forth. Uh, you enter the museum uh, to a, a, a great lobby information area. Uh, the, the, the collection really begins in a kind of six. That is to say, you start here. Uh, the colonial and federal period is in this gallery. Uh, you move into the Hudson River School, the later 19th century, Sargent, uh, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, you cross into early modernism, this lower wonderful kind of armadillo, uh, 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 damming up one pond, a second pond, the stream uh, up there. So literally, as you move through the museum, there are windows, of course, out into nature. She wanted this experience, as I say, where the art itself was to be appreciated, but was uh, perpetually to be integrated with the environmental experience uh, itself. Uh, you move then chronologically through early modernism, the Ashcan School, into early Stieglitz abstraction. Uh, then there are big modern galleries here for the mid 20th century, the later 20th century, and contemporary. This, uh, and then you end up circulating back through a, a second vast hall, uh, which is the restaurant has become enormously popular. First rate, uh, I'd have forgotten how many star chef, reservations for dinner in the museum. There are two nights a week. Uh, you have to make something like six weeks in advance. It's become uh, so popular. Uh, it is also a passageway, as I say, to circulate back to information. Then a huge on the ground floor uh, temporary exhibition space. Um, they've got an active program already set up with cooperation with Atlanta, uh, uh, the Orsay, and the, uh, Kansas City, various other museums. Program is already in motion for special exhibitions changing uh, over the course of the next, I think, at least two, uh, two years. Above, uh, finally above, special exhibitions, uh, is library administration, uh, then a walkway, archival, and a great reception hall that can be used for uh, lectures, gatherings, uh, uh, and so forth. So that's the orientation. The, the architecture itself, as you can get a glimpse, is a mixture of, uh, obviously, of glass, um, of Arkansas, uh, I think it's a blonde, yellow, pine, uh, and copper. And of course, the copper already has begun to, uh, to, to discolor beautifully. Eventually, in another year probably or so, it'll have a, a lovely pale and then darker green patina. But this mix of metal, blonde wood, and glass is really magical. So the, uh, it's one of those museums, I say, where the, what it holds, uh, neither one dominates, neither architecture nor collection. They are both equally dazzling uh, and match each other. Just a couple of views. Uh, Softy has developed these canted glass walls outward, particularly in the restaurant uh, pavilion, uh, where uh, uh, the acoustics, of course, take the noise, uh, bounce it off those walls, and it's absorbed up into the roof line, so that with large crowds, uh, it's amazing how not silent, but how well absorbed. It's not an overwhelming airport uh, kind of noise. Uh, there is obviously, even though the museum is filled on opening day with uh, something like, uh, I think, 300 works were, were, were shown or are shown. The collection now, I would say, numbers um, somewhere around 1,200, uh, approximately a little over or a little under a half of our works on paper, that is to say, um, uh, drawings and watercolors, some prints, uh, some are very limited photography. The print collection is beginning to grow. 
uh, quite a bit of sculpture, which I won't talk about, both uh, small-scale indoor sculpture uh, and uh, uh, at least a dozen major outdoor commissions and purchases of Robert Indiana Love, a great pole manship. Uh, I've mentioned the Roxy Payne, the Ricky, uh, a huge, gorgeous Mark de Suvero, uh, abstract piece, uh, almost two stories high. Uh, and so both the grounds, and again, there's this versatility uh, that she has in, in uh, wanting both small scale works in different media as well as works uh, uh, outside. Uh, the, the collection, as I say, uh, a little over half is probably paintings and uh, uh, sculpture, uh, and the masterpieces are up on view. Uh, here's a, a view of the first curved wall of the Colonial Gallery, and this was a, almost an accidental kind of purchase. It's the, I think there are six, yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, six matching paintings uh, by uh, a, a Dutch immigrant artist named G Gustavus du Kink, who uh, was an established an artistic family in New York at the end of the 17th, beginning of the, <coughs> of the 18th century. Uh, and um, as it turned out, these were, to be de were being deaccessioned, I think, by the, uh, was it the Jewish Historical Society in New York? The, the Levi Franks family, uh, an incredibly rare opportunity. Uh, uh, and I should say, just mentioning historical society, one of the ironic accidents in creating this collection over the last um, uh, near decade uh, has been, the, I have to say, the recession. Uh, because the recession, we realized, uh, uh, you know, moving along, was beginning to make available uh, works of art that we never thought would be acquirable, uh, both from museums or, or, I should say, really historical society collections, uh, and, and private collectors, including great private collectors. Who knew that the Ganses would end up selling their collection two or three years ago? Uh, she was also able to acquire pictures from Myron Cunion in um, uh, uh, Minneapolis and from Richard Manoogian. These are major both corporate and private collections, the Manoogian collection in Detroit. Uh, uh, and indeed, one of Manoogian's most famous pictures I'll show you in a moment, the so-called Mexican War News by Richard Catton Woodville, 1850, uh, or also 1849, uh, had been on long-term loan to the National Gallery, and wearing my other hat, uh, uh, even I didn't know, uh, was suddenly swept off the gallery's walls because it had been on loan from the Nugian. She'd acquired it uh, for Crystal Bridges. So it, it has turned out that one of the reasons she's been able to acquire so much in a short period of time of such high really iconic quality uh, has been, as I say, uh, what, is, what has uh, been put on the market, often uh, privately, not through auction. Uh, the St. Augustine Museum in Florida decided to deaccession, uh, I think, their collection of 20 uh, Martin Johnson Heed oil sketches of hummingbirds and magnolias. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, so there were, as I say, uh, taking advantage of opportunities. I think one of the great revelations to me um, as an art historian and not really being involved in, in buying in this way was how much business is done, uh, certainly in the last uh, couple of decades, by so-called private treaty. Uh, works not going through the auction houses, uh, through the auction rooms themselves, but being uh, uh, sold through the auction houses privately. Uh, many collectors don't want to know that their uh, works are being sold, and obviously there are many collectors, and Alice among them at the time was one who didn't want to announce or, or be known publicly for what she was acquiring <clears throat> until the museum opened. So uh, that provided a way of, of, of also adding, as well as bidding regularly uh, 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 at Sotheby's and Christie's and others. She had, uh, uh, bought works at various other smaller auction houses throughout the country. Uh, I remember many of the press wondered who was her major dealer. Uh, and one of the remarkable things is that uh, they started asking around the dealers in New York, and none of them uh, could say, I am the major funnel of her work. 
It really has turned out uh, that she's bought from a, a whole variety of dealers, not only in New York, uh, but across the country. Uh, but she had been, this was not a, a set of acquisitions uh, that I was involved in. She'd been, I think, um, uh, at Sotheby's looking at some other things. Uh, it might have been a Gilbert Stewart portrait. I can't remember what she said. And looked up around the, the gallery, the, the room itself, and saw these pictures by the, Le the so-called Levi Franks family uh, and said, what are they? And learned that they are the only surviving documented group of a single family by a known artist. Uh, the, the one, in a sense, uh, known grouping that would uh, give it competition, of course, is the great group by the so-called Freak Limner in Boston. Uh, uh, and those pictures uh, can't definitively all be tied together. There's some in Worcester, some in Boston, and, um, and some elsewhere uh, slightly earlier. But these would be the New York equivalent. And, and, and of course, one of the details about them is she learned about this family, the Levi Franks, were among New York's first prominent merchants. And that, of course, struck a note uh, as a Walmart era, so, uh, so to speak. Um, and so uh, they're, they're a fabulous group. Uh, hung, as you can see, on a slightly curving wall. It's not the problem of the Denver Museum with violently cantered sp uh, uh, surfaces. And it, and it serves the purpose, I think you've got a hint here, of the eye being led around the corner to more, as it were, uh, treasures around the corner. Uh, it's a very graceful uh, space uh, that doesn't look like a hospital corridor, uh, but has this kind of animation uh, in, its, um, uh, in its curvature. So that immediately, in a sense, these are about all about 17, I believe, 1735. Um, there are, and I'm done, I, I don't want to run just through highlights, but some of these accidental conjunctions that give clusters, that give themes to the collection. Because early on, as we began to accumulate um, acquisitions, we realized internal collect, uh, connections uh, between earlier works and later works, similar subjects, nature, of course, being one of them, landscape uh, being a major aspect uh, of her interest. Uh, uh, these don't hang side by side, uh, but she is, was able over time to acquire two great Copleys, uh, early Copleys. These are 1765, uh, Mrs. Atkinson, forgotten the gentleman on the right. Um, and, and, and just as a, you know, if I were giving a kind of docent tour of the gallery, uh, the, re the rhetorical question to me, and I'm not sure I can answer it, uh, uh, it's a question we can also raise with Aikens, was Copley a better painter of women or of men. Uh, in the end, I think it doesn't matter because at his best, he was equally good. If I had to make some delineation or distinction, I would argue up close that the Copley handling of dress work, the fabric here, um, uh, uh, is the outstanding aspect of this painting. But I think that the likeness uh, of uh, the, the male portrait uh, is a little tougher. It's got a little more psychological uh, content to it. Uh, but it's a wonderful dialogue. They actually hang on adjacent walls. So they're in the in installation of the collection, there's almost sort of a, a kind of self-education that is possible if you use your eyes and, and look at juxtapositions from one wall uh, to another, uh, moving from gallery to gallery. Likewise, early on, uh, I think given this patriotic interest. Uh, there was the, uh, one of the first acquisitions she made was one of the famous, in this case, three-quarter length Charles Wilson Peel on the left of Washington uh, 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 during the war. Uh, and then uh, shortly after acquired one of the great, this was also a New York Public Library deaccession. And of course, uh, uh, the argument the library made at the time was that it is just that, a library. Uh, that it did not have the curatorial ability or the conservation ability uh, to continue maintaining many of these great masterworks. And so that's how uh, this became available. But I love, the, the, again, the pairing. They're not side by side, but close enough in the sense that both of these artists went abroad, studied with Benjamin West, came back. Both of them became, as it were, court painters to Washington, painting the, really the major life portraits between 1795 and 1805. 
uh, but Peel came back after a very short period of study and, and, and retained in his American career, I want us to argue, this kind of hardness, this almost this stiffness, not necessarily a primitiveness, uh, but there is a hard realism that we would associate, as it were, with an American style. Stewart stayed longer, although he came back and got three sittings with Washington, produced the most famous imagery, uh, the, the head, of course, like the Athenaeum portrait, uh, uh, is the basis for the dollar bill, uh, in, many, in many ways more famous, but there's a softness. Stewart had mastered before he returned something of English 18th century delicacy, the lightness of touch, the softness. You see it in the face, the hair, uh, the drapery, and so forth. So again, it's a wonderful for federal period or revolutionary period portraiture, uh, and you can think of it, you know, the education department uh, using this uh, not only for artistic terms, but for interpretive terms. We had also in this early period acquired this fabulous Gilbert Stewart. Uh, I was particularly pressing for more than just having, as it were, the token Washington. Uh, when we saw this come up at auction, the one here on the left, uh, it struck all of us, certainly me, as a very unusual Gilbert Stewart. Uh, that is to say, the most important thing about it is that it's a horizontal. It's a really, uh, I can't remember whether it's unique, uh, but it's very unusual format. Almost all of Stewart's portraits in traditional colonial federal portraiture is the vertical, of course, the vertical format. Uh, and in this horizontal format, as you see, uh, the sitter, uh, William Smith, who was at the time uh, the provost, uh, an early provost of the College of Philadelphia, soon to become the University of Pennsylvania, uh, an important academic, uh, uh, certainly in intellectual life in Philadelphia at the time, uh, with his academic robes there and so forth. Uh, but it's unusual to me, uh, of course, not just in the shape of the canvas, but the way Stewart intentionally sets the sitter off to the right-hand side. Uh, and gives us the expanse of the Philadelphia landscape, the Schuylkill River, where Smith actually had an estate. And then, of course, on the far left, all of his, as you can see, scientific instruments. Uh, and the way the arm reaches across, we have the head, the hand with the, the quill pen, uh, his papers, books, and then leading into the instrument. So, in a way, you have all of his life. Uh, but I find it a prophetic picture in the sense, this is 183, I believe, a prophetic picture in the sense, for the, almost for the first time, you have the, as it were, the landscape uh, taking as much space as the sitter himself. Uh, and that is a forecast of the great subject that will become uh, a fascinating, to, obsessing, obsessive to American artists uh, in the next quarter of century through the rest of the century, namely American, American nature. So uh, we had no problem, in a sense, acquiring it. And then fortuitously, a number of years later, the second great controversy I think everyone's familiar with, uh, when the Gross Clinic came up for sale, uh, was offered to her first. Um, uh, but of course, and, and, uh, unfortunately, she didn't learn about the proviso uh, that the city had uh, first refusal. That was told to her, unfortunately, uh, uh, after she had made the bid. Uh, whether that would have affected the outcome, who's to say? In any case, um, as you know, it, uh, it was saved for the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and she was able to acquire, to my mind, maybe not as important a picture. The Gross Clinic, it would be considered you know, the preeminent, great, uh, a, a full-scale uh, portrait in the history of American art. But in many ways, a much more beautiful painting, also belonging to Jefferson Medical University, is the first physician portrait that Aikens painted. Uh, and so uh, after the sale of the clinic, the other two were offered, and we acquired this and immediately realized, I mean, not only its own, uh, its own particular importance, uh, but what a wonderful, as it were, companion, not to be hung side by side, but if you responded to one when you get to the uh, uh, two galleries later, how much they share, as it were, as visual cousins. Uh, here was uh, Aikens' teacher at uh, Jefferson Medical College when he himself was a student studying anatomy. 
uh, seen at his desk. Turns out to be a partner's desk. It's a wonderfully mysterious portrait about self-absorption, again, about the life of the mind, the hand, each hand doing something different. One, in a sense, entirely physical, with his gesture stroking the cat, the right hand pointing to the page in the book that he is reading. So you have two, as it were, two kinds of things going on in the body at the same time. The mysterious, wonderful uh, a raspberry robe in the foreground is this a signal that a woman has been present, left the room, uh, a, certainly a signal of, as it were, the, the more feminine side, the more domestic side of the picture, the, the, the carnation. Uh, and then, of course, on the other side, his scientific instruments. Uh, and so we saw these as the kind of thing uh, which, if you go through the museum, museum today over and over again, there are these, um, as I say, these themes and coordinates uh, uh, that uh, uh, add up uh, to an additional kind of resonance. I've always loved this particular Aikens. You can't see it in the slide, but I'll just point out. He signed it in block letters, capital letters, T. Aikens, on this side of the partner's desk. And uh, just as an aside, uh, to me, that's a very interesting uh, psychological question. I worked on it when writing on artist signatures. Uh, as a partner's desk, in a sense, it implies not only is, as it were, Aiken standing out on this side of the partner's desk with his canvas or his sketchbook, uh, but by signing his name as an aspiring artist, now no longer a student, isn't Aikens with his signature saying, as it were, he's the partner, he's going to be an equal in terms of profession, uh, the artist and the scientist, uh, the, the, the teacher and the student. Uh, I think it's just a wonderful sort of psychological implication in the way Aikens painted uh, and finished and made himself present uh, in his portrait of Benjamin Howard Rand. Still life, uh, again, has become prominent in the collection. Uh, very hard to find. Raphael Peel, still life, the son of Charles Wilson. Uh, here an early one from the 1810s. Uh, an ear of corn. The garden, still life, as it were. Uh, the kitchen tabletop with this kind of magic realism becomes an anchor. Uh, and uh, over the course of the years, uh, other still lifes have begun to fill out that. I'll show you a few more. But one of the gems we found by private treaty uh, at Sotheby's uh, is the painting you see on the right, The Rose Garden by Mariah Oki Dewing. Art historians and a few collectors know her work, uh, but tend to know her stereotypically as the wife of Thomas Dewing, uh, the, the great um, late 19th century painter of vaporous women uh, sitting in delicate dresses or floating in gardens. But it turns out that Mariah Dewing was an equally good painter. Yes, I suppose stereotypically uh, that, that women have tended, at least in the 19th century, to be associated with the garden, with flowers, and so forth. But this struck us as absolutely dazzling, partly for its near abstraction, that you're looking down into this rose bed <coughs> without <coughs> any particular sense of space or depth. <coughs> Uh, it seems to me it's got a wonderful kind of natural quality, but also something that's, that's proto-modern. Well, this struck a note that has also continued. Uh, I think some, uh, maybe skeptics or press, would argue uh, that these are acquisitions of a raging feminist, um, that her interest in artists by, uh, works by women artists, which has become, in fact, over time, uh, one of the major signatures of the collection as a whole. It, wasn't in, it was never intentional. Uh, again, we were going for quality in, in, as it were, unexpected places, not only the prominent ones, uh, but the corners of the field. And this, I think, probably now would be viewed as Mariah, one of Mariah Dewing's masterpieces. Uh, and so the, the still life collection, uh, the, the, the acquisition of works by women and also of women uh, has become uh, a theme throughout the collection. Two major paintings from, again, to bring us back to 1849, the great Mexican War News I mentioned earlier by Richard Catton Woodville, who uh, only painted something like 20 pictures that are known uh, <coughs> around mid-century. Very important painting about this, uh, this group of, of gentlemen reading about the, the uh, uh, unfolding Mexican-American Amer Mexican War. 
Uh, art historians, of course, have made the point. Uh, it's a great teaching tool, again, about race and class, uh, that you have the Greek revival form, uh, the portico of the porch framing the men, women, children, uh, and, and uh, African Americans uh, are subordinated, as were, or, or as were, as it were, or marginalized uh, on the side. Um, but it, but it's um, it's balance, it's clarity, uh, in a sense, is a very important picture stylistically about this moment at mid-century. Almost at the same time, a little bit, a few years later, Fitzhenry Lane, artist I've worked on, of course, and you may recognize a little bit of the exaggerated site. This is um, the entrance to Camden Harbor at twilight. Uh, this was almost a steal at auction, I think, again, at Sotheby's, in the sense that some were put off by the lurid coloring. They worried whether it was by his assistant, Mary Mellon. Uh, the Cleveland Museum had actually done, it came out of an impeccable provenance by North Shore Boston family. Um, and uh, the Cleveland Museum had done conservation. And one of the things that I've begun to learn about Lane and his assistant, Mary Mellon, is that Lane's paintings almost all have underdrawing. And sure enough, um, the, the, the conservation report was available at the time. I don't think anybody paid attention to it. But it has Lane's underdrawing, which absolutely corresponds uh, with the drawings that he made uh, of the site itself. Uh, and so it was a, uh, it's a very tiny picture, but it's a beautiful, incandescent little uh, visual gem uh, that uh, 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 anchors uh, the luminous wall and the Hudson River School. Another triumphant cluster uh, is this extraordinary group of Martin Johnson Heads called the Gems of Brazil. Uh, this was an acquisition from the Manuhian collection. Uh, anyone, any of you have known it before. And it tra they, he had traditionally hung them in groups of four, that is say framed as four, like a window frame with four panels. Uh, Alice had them removed and, and, and reframed in period frames. You come around a corner, uh, again, this is a slightly curving convex wall, uh, and it's just breathtaking. These, they are literally gems in every sense of the word, not only in pictorial finish, but it was, a, it was a great project he'd undertaken in the 1860s in Brazil to document, uh, almost in a kind of Darwinian way, uh, birds in their natural habitat, uh, fighting, uh, mating, uh, male, female, etc. An original kind of still life created by Heed, that is to say, a still life in the landscape. Uh, and here's a case where uh, she had no problem buying an artist in depth. So with the St. Augustine collection that she purchased later, this group of pictures, plus a classic uh, haystack picture, uh, 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 one of the rare views of Rio de Janeiro, de Janeiro Bay, uh, and a beautiful white rose hovering against a gray cloud, cloudy sky, uh, probably, I think now, uh, is an even larger collection than the other famous collection, the Carola Collection at the Boston Museum. To move on just to the later 19th century landscapes, just to give you a taste of the kinds of comparisons, um, uh, Eastman Johnson, uh, the final large study, oil study for cranberry pickers on Nantucket in the 1870s, and then one of Thomas Moran's uh, masterpieces of the Green River, Wyoming, uh, began to set up these comparisons, uh, uh, not only of sources, but of different areas of the country, the western landscape uh, and the eastern landscape. Uh, there are very few eastern museums uh, that have western art. She was able to acquire, I'm not going to show you, a William Keith, for example, California, literally California painters represented uh, in the collection. Uh, to move to Impressionism, you make endless juxtapositions. One of the great pictures from the John Hay Whitney collection, uh, John Singer Sargent's uh, uh, painting of Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, the wife seated there on the right-hand side, crossing um, uh, the, the, uh, the living room there, this kind of casualness. And then uh, one of uh, uh, Sargent's followers, again, a very rare uh, a picture, uh, Dennis Miller Bunker, again, very few paintings, these exquisite landscapes uh, of the uh, uh, of, 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 uh, rural uh, uh, suburbs outside of Boston uh, in um, the 1890s. 
to come back to still life uh, from the Gans collection, one of the first pictures she acquired, a summary picture of American trompe l'oeil uh, by John F. Pito, again an artist I've loved working on, called Old Companions. So now you can tell the story of still life from the delicacy of the Peel Federal period uh, through mid-19th century, now coming up to, um, as I say, the worn and tattered, uh, this uh, sort of turn of the century, 1895, 1900. No longer the bright colors of the bunker, uh, but this sense of erosion and disillusionment uh, that comes into American art with the new industrialism, uh, the new immigration, uh, the railroads and so forth, the banking failures, all the turbulence of the growth of urbanism and cities uh, at the end of the 19th century. Pito's art suggests something of that. And then on a kind of whimsy, and yet Alice had no problem buying it, on the right, a palette painted by John Haberly, one of three, uh, that I think we got at the New York Armory show one year, um, where uh, Haberly has painted, as you can see, uh, using the thumb hole as the mouth of the little boy. In this case, he is eating, looks like blueberries or cherries. Another, he's having a tooth pulled. A third, I think he's smoking a cig cigarette. They're an absolute gas. They are, uh, and of course, they're a huge, I, I said right away, these will be among the most <coughs> popular pictures uh, that kids will love going through the museum. So there is this, as I say, it's part of her own spirit, this kind of whimsy. Uh, they're not what people would go to for Haverly. She does have a classic trompe l'oeil of coinage. Uh, but as I say, here's a, a slightly different side. So the still life, as you can see, began to fill out. Again, turn of the century, one of the masterpieces, um, again from Manoogian, I think, uh, the Chicago World's Fair, uh, painted by Theodore Robinson, uh, one of the great American Impressionists at the end of the century, here in 1893, of course. And then a, uh, a relatively rare and highly, seems to me, desirable, very moody, late Remington, uh, where he, he gets almost to these monochromatic colors, particularly of, of greens and blues, night pictures, a very special group of pictures uh, that I think are his greatest works done uh, in the first uh, decade of the 20th century. And moving into the 20th century, finally, the Ashcan, again, a very strong group. She realized over time that there were certain artists that she greatly favored. So while this is a museum that covers with highlights from beginning to end, there are these, these pocket depths that, of course, over time uh, will make little focused exhibitions Hade being one of them, as I've already uh, suggested, uh, but now George Bellows. I think there are about uh, four or five major Bellows in the collection. Three or four of them have gone to the Bellows Show, which is now in Washington, comes to the Met this, uh, this uh, winter or fall. Uh, the Useless, one of Bellows' toughest uh, World War I pictures, uh, where these dis uh, soldiers are discarding uh, <coughs> these captors. Uh, and then a remarkable picture, uh, one of a series of half a dozen, of the excavation of the old Pennsylvania Railroad Station on 8th Avenue. But even more remarkable than the great sort of excavation of a whole city block, the building of New York at this critical moment, not only when the first subway is open, but the first great high rise in the um, uh, uh, the, the, the uh, Flatiron Building, uh, the expansion to the boroughs, uh, the, the building of the great railroad stations, first this and then uh, Grand Central. Uh, again, what it tells about the sociology of the moment, uh, but the fact that it was painted at night, that for the first time, Bellows uh, and, and a few colleagues realized that there was artificial illumination, at least in the major cities around the world, changing our very concept of time, that cities could operate, as it were, round the clock. And so here they are digging away with the fire and pits and so forth and artificial illumination, one of the great transformations in a sense in terms of physics, uh, like uh, the telephone, uh, the x-ray, and the other physics of the early uh, 20th century. There's also a great family group uh, in the collection. Uh, I'm forgetting the, the, the fourth or the fifth. Uh, but Bellows has been a great favorite. Uh, Stuart Davis is another. Morrison Hartley is yet uh, another. You may have read in the papers, she just concluded the negotiation with Fisk University. She owned 
uh, one or two, I would say, modest George O'Keeffe's, but nothing iconic until the acquisition now of half ownership uh, in uh, this great painting done in the teens of the Radiator Building, kind of tribute to her, her husband, Alfred Stieglitz, uh, New York at Night. Uh, this this, uh, this a part of this new group emerging under the umbrella of Stieglitz, who were interested in the combination of realism and abstraction. Uh, of course, uh, uh, O'Keeffe pioneered in that. <clears throat> she was one of the few who didn't go abroad, but of course her contemporaries were sent by Stieglitz, Marin, Hartley, uh, uh, Charles Demuth, and so forth. Uh, Stuart Davis, I've mentioned, a great favorite. Uh, here, one of not the Egg Beater series, but out of the 30s, this kind of uh, adaptation into American terms, as it were, a marriage of the Jazz Age and Cubism, fragmentation where you can uh, partly recognize forms. An artist who has been to Paris, seen something of that modern sensibility, brings it back now uh, to, um, uh, 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 to the New York scene. Uh, juxtapositions of this sort, I've mentioned uh, uh, Marsden Hartley, great late landscape, uh, early landscape. Uh, uh, here, uh, the, the uh, Nova Scotian that Hartley probably fell in love with, uh, late in his career, returns to Maine, makes a trip, spends a summer in Nova Scotia with this um, uh, Canadian family. Uh, two of the sons were lost at sea, a great tragedy. Uh, Hartley, uh, a, 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 a repressed homosexual, uh, lived a very painful nomadic life, clearly was, uh, you know, looking, for, just searching for personal expression. Uh, this, so there's a terrific poignance in the, as it were, hyper-masculinity. It's an incredibly powerful, life-size portrait that dominates its wall. And I just thought, for fun, uh, it makes a, a wonderful kind of comparison to uh, the picture on the baffle behind it uh, to Rosie the Riveter. Uh, she had already what I would call a very ordinary Saturday Evening Post um, sentimental uh, Rockwell of a, doy, a boy and a dog pushing a beach ball of some sort. Uh, but this is a classic. I have no doubt in my mind, didn't discuss it with her, that obviously the American flag, the idea of, of a heroic woman, now this idea had taken uh, hold in the collection uh, that, that images of women at various moments uh, would be a kind of a subterranean theme. Uh, and so in many ways, this uh, great summary picture of World War II, uh, of, of, the, of a women's role in modern life, and again, it's a terrifically commanding visual uh, picture, but, but I suppose to many of us, you wouldn't automatically assume that Rockwell should be placed on the sacred walls of a, you know, sort of a great American collection. Uh, Alice Walden had no uh, hesitation. Moving on, uh, finally, to abstract expressionism. Uh, here again was a case of opportunity. Um, uh, we came late to uh, abstract expressionism. Originally, I think her idea, partly out of her own confidence or even lack of it, it was originally to be just historical American art. I, for one, argued <coughs> that those museums already existed, the Eamon Carter in Fort Worth, the Addison Gallery in Andover. One can think of any number of such collections. There are also, of course, great collections of modernism, beginning with the Museum of Modern Art, the Walker, et cetera. But I said, except for Smithsonian American Art in Washington, there's no museum, single museum, that is really uh, 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 even-handedly uh, collected from uh, colonial period to the present. And so she bought into the idea that we ought to move on from early modernism. Uh, there are interims here I haven't shown you. Stanton, McDonald, Wright, some of the other lesser known artists who were uh, painting uh, in the decade leading up to abstract expressionism. But I said, here's an opportunity, particularly for this part of the country, to be able to show the full story. Uh, and. Um, so we, we broke ground and uh, uh, began visiting dealers uh, and, of course, the auctions for modern, not just uh, American. Uh, and not surprisingly, I think in retrospect, two of the earliest, most important acquisitions were by women artists. Because even now, the market for Grace Hardigan on the left, <coughs> Joan Mitchell on the right, are lesser than the males, the Jackson Pollock, the Rothko, uh, the de Kooning, uh, the Franz Klein. Uh, 
the, the heart, again, is, uh, is a sort of a hard picture to look at. But on the other hand, I think we realize, I certainly argued, that it was a kind of picture that embodied all of the aspects. She had worked with Motherwell. She had worked in, and was friends with all of the other figures in the Abex group. And in a way, the idea of uh, drip painting a la Pollock, uh, color field a la, a la Rothko. There are bits and pieces that look like Hans Hoffman. Uh, in terms of the history of the beginnings of abstract expressionism, this is not only a very beautiful picture, uh, but it is a summary of all of the elements if you want to get into the vocabulary, the rhetoric of abstract expressionism at a very inexpensive price, as I say, compared to the millions one would have to pay if a Pollock were even available, and they're not. Likewise, the Joan Mitchell, she fell in love when she, uh, well, I forgot what gallery it is we went to. Um, oh, I think she was actually abroad. I, this was not something I had something to do, do with, but a dealer was carrying Mitchell's works, and this came out of, I think, a, a Swiss collection and was made available at the last moment. It's an absolutely classic Joan Mitchell, which if you see it, uh, I believe it, it would hold its own on a wall with any of her uh, male counterparts. So the, the, at least this group of things started with these two. She did, have, uh, she did acquire a number of Pollock uh, drawings and prints, so he's represented in the collection. But as she kept reminding me, the museum won't be complete on day one. Uh, so the thrust, at least in the last three years, and um, uh, I really stopped being an advisor about three years ago uh, when she's formed the, the board of trustees, also with the hiring of a professional director, Don Bacigalupi, the then director of the Toledo Museum, uh, the hiring in turn of two very professional curators. They would do the curatorial work. Uh, I get, obviously, am involved at the board level in approving, uh, but I have to pull back and have a slightly different relation now. But the thrust of their acquisitions over the last few years, and certainly going forward, uh, is uh, to begin to fill uh, out that important area. Uh, I, I'm, I'm overlooking a lot here, but moving to pop art, uh, one of the fun acquisitions we made at auction was the Michael Crichton estate, his collection, uh, this huge, uh, oh, it's I think about 10 or 15 feet high alphabet tree by um, Klaus Oldenburg. Uh, it was, uh, there are wonderful photographs sitting at the end of Michael Crichton's swimming pool. Uh, she ag agreed that this would be a classic work of pop art to acquire. Again, as I say, a relatively recent interest, but she realized we ought to have, at least for starters, three or four classic examples by key pop artists. As I said, the Indiana Corten Love was acquired, Major Roy Lichtenstein, uh, and this alphabet tree which is, of course, as you can see, uh, a dripping popsicle standing on its uh, stem with a, well, this wonderful drip of, of ice cream glop down here. Uh, but in fact, these are all bloated uh, letters of the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E. You can make out the whole alphabet down, uh, down to Z squashed in the corner. Typical Oldenburg kind of pun on, on uh, you know, nature, human form, uh, something popular, uh, that is to say, the, po the, the popsicle stick. So we have that, and it's now placed in the, di in the dining room. The end of the dining room looks just great. Um, and then an incredible opportunity about a year ago, because we thought a Jasper Johns, particularly an early Johns, was way beyond reach. Most uh, classic Johns from the 60s, the alphabet series, the numbers, the letters, the maps, are all, what, 30 to 60 more million dollars. Uh, this was an interesting acquisition that where, again, there was, there was hesitant interest. It uh, had come through a New York dealer from a Japanese collection that was deaccessioning uh, uh, under the pressures of their uh, economy and their uh, uh, recession. Um, uh, so uh, it was at a kind of a bargain price, but primarily because, to my eye, a uh, very interesting work from a conservation point of view, it is oil painted over a print, that is to say, on paper, mounted on canvas. Johns had made uh, a print of this particular version uh, and, and drawn only one, uh, one impression, which he gave to the Museum of Modern Art. He kept a second impression for himself 
And it wasn't so much that he was dissatisfied with it, but he thought that it would be a, a, a way of moving to another version, another interpretation. And so we ended up, as I say, painting that new interpretation. Well, we had conservators look at it. Was this going to be a problem of hanging a work on paper? Uh, uh, you know, uh, and deterioration over time. We were assured because it's oil uh, over, over the full surface of the painting uh, and then mounted that it really could be treated and hung <coughs> as, a, uh, as a canvas. And of course, we realize aside from its importance, uh, again, at an incredibly reasonable price, really a, a bargain price, what a wonderful compliment in its own way uh, as, the, as one of those artists like Rauschenberg who set the stage for pop art, it, still painting here uh, uh, alphabet uh, jumbled across the, but still with that kind of gesturalism picture that absolutely summarizes the last gasp of abstract expressionism moving into uh, the commercial imagery, as it were, of pop art. Uh, they're wonderful, wonderful, again, wonderful puns. Uh, she, for the most part, up until recently thought Warhol was beyond um, uh, reach, and of course the famous uh, you know, uh, Campbell soup cans, the car wrecks, and so forth, are again often uh, $50 million pictures. She decided, for the time being at least, uh, that she would go with Dolly Parton at a, uh, 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 a very uh, 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 accessible price. Um, you know, local to, to this region of the country, a wonderful uh, image filling the screen, uh, all white. And then we had the opportunity at our auction to buy Wayne Tebow. And of course, everybody would, uh, would assume that you'd want a Wayne Tebow of cakes or pies or pastries. Uh, and so again, she was able to get it at a reasonable price, uh, I think, that was highly competitive for two reasons. One, it was obviously not a cake or a pie, but it was treating a human being like a, a sort of a, a slice of ice cream. This was his daughter, he said one day, uh, lie down on the floor and painted this strangely, I think, fascinating picture where you don't see the ground, you don't see the wall, yet there is a sense of recession. She's not dead, she's staring at the ceiling. Uh, it's the most bizarre but haunting, whimsical kind of picture that is classic Tebow. So again, it, it was a classic picture, but not conventional, and that, that appealed to her. The other was there was, there was a minor, I recall, crease in the canvas down in the corner uh, that bothered most dealers, wouldn't touch it. Uh, but again, that was easily repaired without affecting uh, the surface at all. And these actually hang side by side. It's a wonderful wall seeing the two together. She had in the collection uh, in the late 19th century this Alfred Moore uh, of uh, uh, obviously a street woman smoking a cigarette. Uh, Moore, not a household name, but certainly stands up. It's sort of halfway between Sargent and Henry, a classic full length picture uh, that holds its own. It's now on a wall adjacent to a Whistler and a Sargent full length picture. That was in the collection. So when Christie's got this Wesselin, and I had written a book on Wesselin, which I think she certainly had read, we never talked about it. Damned if she didn't, didn't consult me on it at all, simply went and bought the smoker mouth, uh, which is, you may be able to determine, it's about uh, seven or eight feet big. It's a shaped canvas. And she immediately said, let's hang them side by side, two women smoking. They're not, they're not side by side, but again, it's one of those sort of hidden wits uh, that as you go through collection, you see the resonance of the Wesselman pop work uh, going back uh, to the Alfred Moore. I also said, I think there's a grain of truth. Alice is a, is a reformed smoker. It has been extremely difficult for her to give up smoking. Uh, bu buying art is a perfectly good way to overcome that problem. <laughs> and finally, uh, uh, modern landscape. I took it to our friend Richard Estes. Uh, she came up the coast one few summers ago, stopped in Portland, uh, uh, and began over these last few years uh, to enjoy meeting artists. Once she realized she needed to collect contemporary, uh, we, we went to Chuck Close's studio, went, visited Alex Katz, um, uh, uh, various other uh, uh, artists whom she gradually began either to buy directly from them or their dealers. She began to feel comfortable talking to artists, uh, again, uh, uh, working with dealers in contemporary art. 
uh, both here, I took her to Richard's studio, uh, where she bought a woodland picture. Uh, we went to his New York apartment, where he was at work, nearly three quarters finished. One of his great series he did a few years ago uh, from a visit um, to Antarctica. An extraordinary painting of water, ice, as you can see, and snow on the side of the boat. Uh, these are among his most monumental, uh, uh, you know, his push beyond New York realism uh, to this other kind of water reflection uh, in the Arctic. But I realize the size from it's important. Then we went to his dealer, Marlborough, where she bought yet two more landscapes. Another artist, as I say, collected in a kind of mini depth. But I also realized, and we all did, that it fit the collection beautifully because it had resonance going back through the artists in the upper right, namely Frederick Church, a classic uh, American landscape. This is before Maine. This is a, an imaginary New England landscape. The church at the height of his powers in the 1850s, uh, <coughs> acquired from the, uh, the Gantz collection when they first started deaccessioning. But even further, and of course, Church has been one of uh, Estes' major inspirations, uh, particularly in the last uh, decade and, con and uh, uh, contemporaneously. Uh, but of course, Church was the student of Thomas Cole, where we began. And we had earlier acquired one of two Coles, a pair of Coles. This one, of course, in the upper left of Mount Etna and Tau from Tower Mina. Uh, and I realized in a, a kind of fun sort of way that if you get through the collection, you realize that the Estes looks all the way back through an artist he admired, who in turn admired and studied with Cole, uh, uh, also painting a snow-covered uh, mountain peak. So uh, there you have uh, an extraordinary collection that is underway. And all I can say is the, the ride is ongoing. Thank you very much.